Good morning. I have not asked in advance uh, uh, people that might need our prayers. I know that's a given. And I know something else is a given. Before you open the Bible, you should open your heart and your mind, and you should open yourself to God, your heart in prayer. Uh, so do we have anybody that knows somebody specific that needs prayers urgent? Okay. Okay. Any brother? Ernie, would you lead our minds? Let's pray together. Good morning, Father. It's your children here at Central again, and we're always <coughs> amazed that the creator of everything will stop and listen to us. Thank you for that. Help us never take that for granted. There are people in our congregation who know about some we don't know that are in need of your help and your prayers, and we trust you, Father. We're selfish, so we're asking that everything will be fine, but we trust you. I ask you to be with Mark today as he leads us instead of your word. Help us all learn from it and use it to go out and reach the people in Ocala. All of you ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the overriding theme of these lessons, these are not just children's stories. And I wish I could tell you the conversations I have had just this week where people are going, wow, wow, or, wow. Because I'm reading things to them from the Bible that they have just had interactions with other people today, this week, last week. And they saw almost identical quotes from the Bible from attacks or from other people claiming things and they saw that the same thing happened nearly 3,000 years ago to somebody else that is happening to them. When they see something in their life and then they see it here in the book, whether they even have ever read this book, they go, wow. And they just chalk it up sometimes to history repeats itself. Okay, history repeats itself, and whether you accept this book or not, this is relevant, because what encouraged them can encourage us. What they endured, we have endured as well, or we've known others who have endured it as well. We have, <laughs> we have the story of uh, Joseph this morning. And I, I chose Joseph like I chose the topic of sin when I was young and younger and dumber. I chose the so topic of sin because I thought I knew a little bit about it. And I knew that there was a whole lot of material that I could find on the subject. Well, I knew Joseph was the second largest narrative in, in Genesis. You've got Adam, and then you got Noah. And if you can remember that, that's the first part of the entire uh, chapter in the book. And then you've got the flood. Well, after the flood, you've got Tower of Babel, where man's arrogance wants to make themselves gods or want to share power or control or something with God. Uh, but after that, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the key pin, I think, before Moses and Joshua that we just covered, the bridge is Joseph. Joseph is that bridge between Abraham, who doubted God at times, it seems. He had his issues going on. He even had deception. His children, Isaac, Son repeats the sins of the father sometimes, right? And then Jacob, Jacob and Esau, all that we can read about that and that conflict and how their descendants to this day dominate the world 
issues, it seems, at times, or has been, or worse, it's easily stirred by other people to keep a conflict going when maybe if people would just leave things be, they would calm down. But it's always going to be there. It's always going to be an easy thing to stir up between their descendants. And a lot of that is because of the sins of their fathers, those who started it all. When you go to Joseph's story, though, you read of an obedient son who had the favor of his father. We were a little bit later today because I was waiting for my favorite son to wake up. Uh, he was my first, but, but you know what? The youngest is my favorite too because he's my youngest. Is that wrong? And the middle son, he, he looks better than both of them. Is he my favorite son? No. Okay. You've got an obedient son. You have also have the son of the woman that he really loved, the woman that got his eye to begin with. Is that wrong? Is it wrong for him to like a, a son that maybe was a miracle birth, it seemed, or might have seemed, might have been? She didn't have, didn't have, didn't have, and then all of a sudden she has a son. Favoritism, deception, all that went into the people before him. What are, are there horse thieves in your family's history? You know, somewhere, someone? <laughs> My family doesn't have to go back too far to find one. And I think he's still in jail. You know, and he's in a far state, so I won't talk because I, I don't really know. But if somebody else in your family has a history, does that mean you will have that history? Every one of us can be a generational changer like Joseph. Joseph was different. Joseph was sent ahead of his family to deliver them, to deliver much people. He delivered his family, but he delivered his nation, and he delivered the people in the world around them so that they all could survive because of him. Genesis 37 starts off with his dreams. Three times in the very beginning, verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it, it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. They had already hated him because the father favored him and the father gave him that coat. But now we read that he's got dreams. Someone has told me, keep your dreams to yourself. If, if you got goals, sometimes keep those goals, keep those dreams, keep those hopes, keep those ambitions to yourself because somebody will come along and squash them. Somebody. And you're better off just keep pressing on or share those dreams with only people that will support you. His brothers were not in the mood to support him. It, it, it says again in verse 8, the same thing, and he had dreams, and he, he explicitly makes sure they hear the dreams. And then going down, verse 9, the same thing. And his father, even his father and mother, he says, according to these dreams, are going to bow down. Now, remember, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his family's heritage. His father, Abraham, had been told that your descendants are going to go away into faraway land. I don't know that Abraham knew it would be Egypt. But they knew about dreams. In all of my study for the last two months, knowing this was coming, I wondered, did Joseph know as a 17-year-old that these dreams were from God? Right here, at least three times, we see these dreams. I think that's significant. But 
his brothers already hated him to the point that they could not speak. If you ever hate to the point that you cannot talk to that person, you cannot talk about that person, you better check yourself. Don't let yourself get to that point. Because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, ye have heard it was said by them of old time. Over and over and over, he says this. And he says it when you have hate in the heart, when you call your brother stupid or raka. Check it at the heart. Stop it at the heart. Don't let it progress. It's not just murder that's wrong. It's what precedes murder, hate and envy. The, the politicals of the world, they love to stir the pot. They love to stir that pot, and it's easily stirred. But the problem is, when you stir the pot of hate, you can't stop it. And when you allow hate in your heart, it blinds your eyes to what you should see within yourself. Joseph dreamed these dreams. His father rebukes him. And yet, it says in verse 10 and 11, verse 11, his father observed the sayings, which reminded me of Mary when Jesus was in the temple. He told her, I must be about my father's business. But it was Mary that it says she pondered those things in her heart. Whether you understand it now or not, sometimes you just have to take what you hear and hold on to it and think about it, ponder it. You've got the dreams and the reaction to the dreams. And right here, we see two brothers. When they see the dreamer come, they want to kill him. That's what hate does. That's why you cannot ever let your feelings be stronger than what is reality. It was just a dream. You're going to kill somebody because of a dream? Because he thinks he's better than you if you want to see it that way? Because he believes that or he has a doctrine different than yours? Well, they wanted to kill him to see what would come of the dreams. But check this. And when you see it later in the story, I, I kind of chose this topic because I, I really wanted to read and see the emotions in what they were saying later in chapter 42, 3, and 4. It's, it's you, can, you will cry if you read these uh, interactions between the brothers. You will laugh at times. You might stand up and want to cheer at times. Brother C. I think also uh, the reason they wanted to tell him was both jealousy would go back to their mm -hmm. Most loved by the father. <coughs> Well, and, and it does. It, it's, it's the, it, they hated him before he told them the dreams. And they hated him. It, it says in the King James, yet the more, yet the more, yet the more. And it just, how do you get more than wanting to hate somebody? And that hate just, just built up. It just built up. That's why Jesus says what, go back to that Sermon on the Mount. Go back to that. I tell you, nay, you know, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. They had a righteousness that was, that allowed for hate, allowed for some of these things that you could do this to a brother if you said this, or you could do this to your parents if you said that. Chapter 38 goes to the topic of Judah, but just, just keep that because that's a, almost a parenthetical because of the importance Judah is going to have later. The most compelling story in these chapters to me is when later we'll read what Judah says to his brother who becomes the governor of the land. But 39, 
Joseph's advancement, you might say. He is sold as a slave. And yet Judah, as a slave, is favored by God. Every step of his life, he is favored by God. And he is favored so much so that people see it and they recognize it. They know his favoritism. Was it a problem when his father favored him? Is it a problem if God favors you? I have told people, and I have felt it sincerely, that I am God's most spoiled child because of what he's done for me. And I think a lot of, a lot of husbands and wives feel like, oh, I'm the lucky one in our marriage. And then the spouse, the other spouse says, no, I'm, I'm the lucky one. Well, we feel favored. And that's okay. God favored him. And people saw it. People realized it. People who were not followers of Jehovah, maybe, but they knew that this guy is favored. The only thing that really upsets me was he was really good, apparently, in math and bookkeeping. That's not my forte. Never was. But you know what? That was part of his success, too. Part of his success was he was incredibly good looking. He was incredibly smart. He was incredibly disciplined. He would have been one of those who Buddy Payne showed that sat out there and watched the stars or studied the stars. I've seen the stars with the limitations of our light pollution, but I've never studied them. And who among us have, have just sat there and studied and watched them over day or night after night? Maybe took notes. What well, Joseph was, he was the most rounded child you might find. I don't know. He might speculate on him. But if he was taunting his brothers when he told the dreams, I don't know that. And we probably don't have the time to go into, in a small circle, we could go back and forth and, and we could exchange our thoughts there. But chapter 39, his looks, his favoritism is not just from his dreams or from his father, but it's also from God. He teaches us something that so many of us need to go know. And maybe this is another reason. Maybe this is the main reason I chose Joseph. In verse 6 of 39, it says that this person left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and was favored. Verse 7, verse 8, and 9 and following, we have his wife casting her eyes on him. He says that his response to her was first about his master. I have control. I have charge of everything. Everything he's given to me except for you because you are his wife. Any culture, any peoples, any religion, so far as I know, basically say, you don't take another man's wife. That's hands off. That's, that's, that's the worst of the worst. And yet he comes back and says, how can I do this against God? To resist the temptations of the flesh, you need to know what the consequences of those temptations of the flesh are. And he knows it's first 
other relationships that he cannot betray a trust. He has a trust from his master, from his employer, if you would. But he also has a trust from God over his own body, a sin of fornication, that sin which is against one's own body. He understood that. How and why, I don't know. But they knew, they knew God's will, and they knew right and wrong. And I suspect anybody, anywhere, anytime know that certain things are not right. We know it because we've been raised to read the scripture. We've read how she lured him or seduced him or tried to crown him. And at a certain point, he just left his cloak in her hands and he took off. He was out of there. And I suspect every young man, if they have not read this, they should. Because there might be a moment where your inspiration will come from Joseph. And you will get up and you will get out. Because the only thing that's going to save you from sinning against yourself is physically, literally getting up and putting distance between you. Don't go there. Don't be there. Don't, don't do it. Just get up and get out. Don't even go there to begin. Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7. Deal with this sin. One brother who has since passed away was trying to tell me who Bob Dickey was. And I could not place Bob. And then he said, oh, he preached that sermon up in Jacksonville. I think it was across the river from, well, across the river, uh, from Orange Park. And when he said he's, he preached that sermon about the path to hell, I went, oh, I know, I know. He preached on the temptations and how this woman would lure the simple man. And, and he warned that this sin leads to hell. This sin decays the body, the mind, physically, literally. It leads to sickness and death. It, you just go in a life in a spiral worse and worse and worse. It's not a good spiral to be on. He says, how can I do this against God. So you have to, if you read this, study this, and guard yourself. And I don't think it's just young people either. We had many a good conversations with Colin, but also with Miss Betty, with her cake delivery, and some of the people that she delivered it to, and some of the older people. We've got a higher rate, according to my RN sister, of STDs south of us because people think they're older. They don't have the fear of pregnancy. They're supposed to be mature adults. My, my daughter who trains and breeds dogs, she said, Dad, why do you think I spend so much money on testing these dogs before they mate with another dog. You have to do that. And with humans, it's even worse. The disease that they can get. People think there's no accountability. Even if the government says this is fine. Even if all the peers say this is fine. Even if it's glorified. It's not fine. It will come back to catch you. And yet... Have you ever done the right thing and then get in trouble for it? He did the right thing and yet he paid a price for it. We've done the right things at times and we paid the price and I suspect every one of us at some point or another we drew a line and we said no and yet we got in trouble for it. It happens. Boss, falsely accused, goes to jail. His, his master did, was angry. 
Did he believe his wife? I don't know, but I know this. His master was angry and put him in jail. I do not know for sure that Joseph knew that his dreams were from God. I suspect he did. And I suspect if we know that God is favoring us, that we can endure any trials. We can endure being sold by your brothers. We can endure almost being killed by your brothers. We can endure being taken by force. He later tells the cupbearer or the butler and the baker, he says, I was taken by force from my country. I suspect if we have the mentality that we know we are favored by God, that we can endure and we can accept any trial, we can accept the worst trial knowing it can be better, that good can come from all of this bad stuff happening to us. Uh, he has two men who have a dream. Now, think about this from a business networking kind of mentality. He, he's in charge of the prison, and yet he's, he's building relationships here. <laughs> Remember me, you know, I, I gave you this interpretation from God, and interpretations belong to God. He never saw the good things that he had, the gifts that he had as me, myself, and I. I have read the statement, and, and it seems very true. You can have the right DNA. You can have the greatest abilities. You can have the greatest mind, have, have even great work ethic, and yet you can blow it all if your character is rotten to the core. You can look good, you can be tall and handsome, you can be strong, you can, you can have a great work ethic, but your character is always about your own greed or your own lust. You will cut your foundations out from underneath you and you will bring down your own destruction. He seems to know this. He interprets the dreams for the butler and the baker. One of them is restored to his position and totally opposite what he was asked. Remember me, remember me, and he doesn't. The baker, his dream is fulfilled to you, and he is executed. Nowhere does it seem that Joseph took this gift for granted or that he was boastful of it which makes me think maybe as a teenager, he did not as well. I don't know. But it leads to Pharaoh's dreams. And until Pharaoh's dreams in verse chapter 41, until Pharaoh's dreams in 41, we don't see the butler remembering his own dreams fulfilled. But when Pharaoh has his dreams, that's the spark that says, okay, I remember. During all that time, what was Joseph doing? I don't know, push-ups? What do you do when you're in jail? What do you do? He was just being the best prisoner he could be. Someone said, if, you, if you're a garbage truck driver or or you're working in the fields, you be the best worker you could be. To this day, I, I remember one brother was better than any of us. And my goal was always to be as good as he was and I never could be. But the idea is when you're in the field, be the best one you can be. When you're in class, be the best student you can be. When you're on, in your first restaurant, be the first Entrepreneur, best entrepreneur you can be. Be the most responsible you can be. It doesn't matter what others are around you have done. It doesn't matter what those before you have done. It doesn't matter what those who supposedly inspect you have done. They can be as corrupt as they want to be. They can be as 
pathetic or lazy as they want to be. It's still up to you, though. And Joseph was responsible as a prisoner. He was responsible as a slave. And now he comes to Pharaoh, and he sets the record straight from the get-go that dreams belong to God. Interpretations go belong to God, not me, not us, not any of us. He did not squander any of his gifts based on having a character that had flaws. You can have the you can have all the gifts. You can all have all the blessings, but if your character is rotten, and we've seen it over and over and over where somebody that we saw on TV that we admired and then you find out they've got some character flaw that just wasted all those all those talents if you know the story the seven cows and the seven good years the seven bad years and and telling and advising the strongest man in the world what to do find somebody who can oversee this this was a smart pharaoh he said who's smarter who's wiser who's more favored by god than you you are so take care of this and all of a sudden he's getting a cloak or a coat of many colors again, isn't he? He's favored by his father. He's favored by God. Now he's favored by Pharaoh, having been favored by the guy in charge of the prison. He's in charge of it. Been favored by his owner as a slave, favored time and time again, and yet he doesn't squander that. Whatever blessings you ought have are the blessings that you ought to be or share or show or give away. You're blessed to bless, and that's what he does. He takes charge. And how do you how do you mentally go from a prison to a governor? How do you go from the prison to the highest that there is? I, I read a quote and I have it written down somewhere from Nelson Mandela. He said when he left the prison, he knew he must leave his bitterness in that prison. He must leave the bitterness in the prison. That if he did not leave his bitterness behind, that he would continue to be a prisoner. You have to leave it behind. You can't live with your bitterness. You might have somebody, you might have something that is hard to forget. You have to. You have to put it behind somehow. Put it behind. And maybe the way to put it behind is keep moving. Keep moving. We know the story. We see the dreams interpreted, the dreams are coming true, and then his father hears about it. There's going to be a couple points that could be made about them coming down here, and and if you you will take this afternoon or sometime this week, and I love to listen to the Bible read on my phone, If you don't have an app that can do that, maybe consider doing it. I have have used that to promote Bible reading with non-Christians. And I've used it to promote Bible reading with those that don't read the Bible like they say they want to or they say they should. And yet they they can push a button on the phone and it can pop up. When I was having some of my anxieties a year or two ago, I got to where I was just pushing the button on Psalm 91 and let it repeat. It'll let it repeat. Wake up, doze off. Wake up, doze off. Wake up, doze off. Psalm 91 kept playing. Sometimes 
if you need to do that, do that. But Joseph's brothers go down. The first time they go to Egypt, no problem. Let's go buy some corn. Let's come home. No, if you know the story, it's just, a, it's, it's a, it's, you could read this. You could read this just for the entertainment. If you wanted to, if you have never, your friends, tell them, you have never seen a story. You've never read a story that has so many ups and downs and exciting points and then tear-breaking moments where his brothers are coming and they don't know him, but he knows them. Oh, he knows them. And he sets them up. He does this. He does that. He's testing them. It seems that he's testing them. Who are you? Do you have a father? Do you have a... Anybody else in your family? He's finding out what they're made of. He also knows his dreams. He, he has not forgotten his dreams. It said when he had children, he named one, meaning I've forgotten my father, my brother, my home. But you know what? He has not forgotten his dreams when he sees his brother show up. And he's the most powerful man in the land other than Pharaoh himself. All this time, he has waited, not vindictively, I don't think. He knows the dreams. He knows his purpose. Some have said, why didn't he go back to Canaan? It's not that far away. He's the governor. He could have taken a quick trip up there and seen his father and got revenge on his brothers. He knew his dreams. He knew the dream was that they would bow down to him. His brothers, why did God choose these men who would want to kill him? Why did God choose these men who would sell him into slavery? Why did God choose those kind of men who come from a family history with a broken family? Deception, you name it. It seems they have it. God didn't choose them. And he might not choose me in my imperfection today, but he might choose me for what I'm becoming. A great friend and mentor says, we are human becomings. We are not merely human beings. Human beings is what we are right now. When you see somebody out here in the street or in your business or a competitor or a friend, and they got major flaws. It's not about what they are now, but it's about what they are becoming. God chose men based on what they would become. And when, if you, if you will skip forward and read what Judah comes before uh, Joseph and pleads, he says, "Send Benjamin home. Take me. Take me." He's in tears. And it doesn't get any any better. And there's parts of this that I kind of wanted to read, but I knew I'd be in tears too. You cannot read some of this without the emotions just overwhelming you. But Judah, did Joseph know about Ru uh, Reuben? Did he know about uh, Judah? Did he know that Reuben was going to go back and rescue him from the pit? Did he knew, know that, Jude, that if Judah hadn't come and done what he done, did and offering to sell him, that he would have been rescued and he'd been home free? If you want to do a project and just go through this, you know the story mentally, so start at the end of the story where the father is brought down to Egypt they are under the care and protection of Joseph. They have everything they could ever want. And then back up and back up and back up and back up in the story. Nothing that happened at the end would have happened without the things right before it. Nothing would have happened there except for what came right before it. Joseph would never have been sold. He would never have been tempted. He would never have gone to prison if he had done wrong. 
Nothing would have happened except God's providence at every point of the way. Is God protecting you? Has God protected you? Has God blessed you at times? Has things worked out that you thought was horrible, was wrong, was terrible? You cannot read chapter 44 and 45, I don't think, without becoming emotional when you read these brothers' interactions with each other. I do wonder if when we are in the midst of some packing and deciding what to keep and not to keep, when he gave free, when he gave clothes to the family, it was five changes of clothes to his brother Benjamin. I kind of want to put that as a mark. I don't need more than five changes of clothes. <laughs> Throw out everything else. Uh, wow. That was special to them. Chapter 47 on, uh, everything that he did, 47, 48, going into eventually Jacob's death, eventually Judah's death, I mean, eventually uh, Joseph's death, but the whole thing, that everything, everything said, God's going to visit you. Just believe that. Just believe that. God's going to protect you. I've taken all the time to talk because there's no way I can read 12 chapters. But let me just take a minute, if we have a minute. Any, any, anything that you've ever wondered about this or that you would make a point about? It's amazing that he changed one man in a family, a rotten family actually, but one man changed them. He changed his brothers. One man. Not just changing the legacy of his children, he changed his brothers' families forever and ever because he was an obedient child who continued his obedience throughout his life. I, th I think that sums up Joseph. He was an obedient child who liked being favored. I like being favored. <coughs> I like it that God favors you. And every one of us has a place, has a role, has whatever we go through. We can shine through it in spite of it, maybe. Yeah. Uh, next week, we have Charlie is teaching on Samson. So if you will, kind of do some exercises before you come so you feel strong and muscular and you can relate to the story, okay? Uh, but these are not children's stories. They are, but they're much, much more, okay? Appreciate that.